Well, good morning to all. Okay, we are talking, <coughs> pardon me. <coughs> we, we are talking about uh, feeding models and this, this class, this lecture is, is about a general way to, to fit models and Diogo will show you in the next lecture another way to do that. So we have two lectures for that because we will talk first about how about fitting itself and then the next steps once you fit a model, say inference and model comparison and things like that. So just a quick recap. So at this point, I hope you are convinced that statistical models describe some distribution probability of random variables, which are the measurements that we take from nature, which are our data. And we do that, we build statistical models by making some parameters of probability distributions functions of other variables that we call predictor variables or independent variables, right? We also learned how to fit a linear regression model, which is a specific class of, of of statistical model, uh, where you have a response, a single response or a single dependent variable, which is described as a Gaussian random variable that has an expected value, which is a linear function of another variable that we call the independent or the predictor variable, right? And we also learned that to fit this specific, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm a step forward. So this is, again, our notation to describe this model. I omitted the sigma here because it's, it's constant in this model. And we also learned that to fit this specific model, we can use a method called the least square method. And this method is basically finding the parameter values that minimize the sum of the square of the residuals of this model. All these concepts and words that I'm saying, that do they make sense for you? I mean residuals, so on. Okay, please interrupt me and make any questions at any time. Okay, and we also learned that we have uh, the estimators of the, the least square methods. And here I'm writing down the estimators for the parameter of the slope of the linear function that describes the expected value of, of the random of the response. And here is the expression for the estimator of the intercept of this linear function, right? So I would like to stress that our notation here put a caret symbol in the, the symbols of, of the parameters of the model. With this, we are meaning that this is not a parameter anymore, and we used to call this beta, beta hat, beta one hat, and beta zero hat. And we are meaning with that that this is not the parameter anymore. This is, the this is an estimator of this parameter. So we don't know the true value of parameters. We don't even know if the model we are proposing is the best model to describe our data, but we pose one. And when we pose some statistical model, this model has parameters, and we have to find some good guess, good guesses for these parameters. So this is the notation to say, OK, I will try to guess this. And my guess, according to this method, the least square methods, is this expression. And with this expression, we can see that we build a guess on this, this parameter value with data. All these quantities here, x, y, is each observation of the independent variable. X, x bar is the sample mean of the independent variable. And this is the same for the dependent variable. All these quantities we can get from our data. So we are trying to guess the value of the parameters of this model with the data we, ha we have at hand, right? OK. So these are the estimators for the, this method. You, you applied these estimates. You calculated these estimators to fit 
some linear models in our exercise in our computer lab. And today what we have ahead, we will see that the least square methods is indeed a good idea to guess the values of, of, of parameters in a statistical model because it actually is a particular case of a much more general method to fit in statistical models, which is called the maximum likelihood method. Um, well, and this method is quite general, so you can fit many, many, many kinds of statistical models with that. We will see how. We will see actually the general principle, the general idea. And we will see how you can estimate the parameter values with these methods. And these estimators are called maximum likelihood estimators, or MLE. Okay. So ML, ML stands for maximum likelihood method, ML, MLE for maximum likelihood estimators. And again, finding MLEs is a way to fit the model, because fitting a statistical model is just to find good guesses for your parameters, right? So let's get back to our friend, the linear regression. Here's again the way we are writing down this model. And this is the representation I've been using in my first lecture. So you have the data, red points, this line is the expected value. I, and I'm representing that there are some normal distribution behind, uh, around this expected value with this gradient of colors trying to depict that close to the expected value according to the normal distribution. If you are close to the expected value, you have more probability to, to find measures in this region. And as you depart from this, this expected value, the probability of finding some measure, the probability of one measure is, is uh, decreases, OK? So I will change these this figures by that one for figures of this kind, where I will represent only two bands, only two stripes or belts. The first one, the inner one belt, represents the central half of the normal distribution, which means that according to this model, about half of the, the points should lie within this belt, right? So this is the 50% quantile of this distribution. And the other, the outer belt, which is in a light color, it's the 95% quantile. This is not the confidence intervals of this, of this model. We will get back to this in the next, in the, the tomorrow, in the next lecture. But this is only to, to stress that any statistical model assign probabil assigns probabilities to our data. So we are talking about probabilities that the probability each of these points according to this model has some probability to be observed, right? Okay. So that's why in the, my first lecture I said that models, statistical models, are hypotheses. Because when I set a model like that, so this is a normal, this is a li uh, simple linear regression with parameter beta 0, 10, parameter beta 1, 1, 30, and the parameter sigma 5. So I set up a model. I specified the values of the parameters. Never mind how I did that now. Just think that I have this model. And once I, I, I set this model, I have an hypothesis of, uh, I have a model that says how data could be generated. I don't know if my data has been generated like that, but I have an hypothesis of how data can be generated. It's, this model is a hypothesis that say, okay, your data has been generated by by a normal distribution with this, these characteristics, with these parameters. So if we think this as an, a hypothesis, we can think on many other hypotheses, right? So I'm changing 
the model and building another alternative hypothesis here. And the only difference between these two hypotheses or these two models is the intercept. Here, sorry, it's the slope. So here, the slope is 30, and here the value of beta 1, which is the parameter that represents the slope, is half than this. So what we would like is to use the data to find which of these hypotheses are better supported by the data. What do you think about these two hypotheses? Any guesses? The left one, just one, oh, sorry. Spoilers ahead. Uh, why? Do, uh, all of you, do, do you agree? This looks way better supported by the data than this one. Sounds reasonable. Why? Oh, uh, we are for getting to use the mic. Our friend Mike. Uh, the second one looks like uh, has more outliers than the other one. This one has more outliers. Yeah, looks like. Looks like, yeah. Okay, we are doing just a visual inspection of the model. Not, it's enough for that, for my point. Okay, you can see, you say you have more outliers, maybe these guys and these guys here. And when I change the slope, I have less outliers, okay. What does it mean? What do you think will happen with the sum of the square of the residuals in this case? It's higher. It's higher. Okay. Because you have more points that are far from, you, ha you have large residuals, you have more points that are far from, from the line, right? So saying that we have outliers, outliers is the same to say that the least square, the sum of the square of, of the residuals will be larger. Make sense? Okay. So far, tell me if I'm right. So far you are taking, to, to decide to say this is a better hypothesis or this is a, a, a model that is better supported by the data, you are looking for the distance or the average distance of the points to the line of the expected value, right? Okay, so here goes my next question. These two models have exactly the same values for the, the linear function. The only difference is that for this model, the other parameter, which is sigma, which describes the spread of the data around the expected value, increases with x2. Do you have any guess which, of, which one is better supported by the data? The left one again. The left one again. And why? <laughs> yeah. So you want me? You, do you want me to elaborate why? Left is nice. <laughs> right. <laughs> I like it. Um, it looks like the average distance from the line remains constant along the line. Uh, the, it looks like there is no spread as x increases. So yeah. It, it looks like, sorry, a pardonia. The average it. distance looks to be constant around x, ar around the, the line. And yeah, because, you know, uh, uh, let, I don't know if it's exactly that you meant here, but the points are the same, the line is exactly the same, the only thing that changes is the, the, predict, the predicted spread of the predicted value of sigma as a function of, of x. Is that, is? Yeah. Okay. So, uh.
uh, the dispersion of the points seems constant. I think that's what he meant to say. The dispersion is of of the points along the along the line. Yes. Seems co seems constant. So it does it doesn't give any reason for you to think that the sigma par the yeah. sigma parameter might increase or decrease. Nice, nice. So you take a look at the points so you don't see any reason to make sigma lower here. Yes. Great. Okay, bunch of leftists. <laughs> um, one way to look at that, or another way to say what you are saying, is that this model assigns way less probabilities to these points here. See? It, these points are outside of the 95, so they, according to this model, these points ha have less than 5% of probability to, to be observed. But they are here, and they are here too. And if you count this, you will see that you have more than 5% of the points outside this belt. So another way, I think, another way to say what you are saying is that this model assigns low probabilities to a lot of, of observations. So if they are observations, they were observed, so there's something wrong with this model because they are, it is saying that what you see could not happen at this frequency, right? Make sense? Everybody's following this? reason? Great. So we can think on a more general way to gauge the support that data gives to different models based on the probabilities that each model assigns to each observation. So this is the key point in this, in this lecture. So just to make this point clear, take again this model here. And as any statistical model, it can assign, it assigns actually, a probability value to each point. So for example, take this point, this point is the point with the x value of 0.5 and the y value of 32. So what's the probability density, what's the value of the prob no normal probability density that this model assigned to this specific point, it's quite easy, is just to find the two parameters of the normal at this point. One of the parameters is mu, or the expected value. So I have to apply this linear function to find out that for point five x equal to 0.5, the expected value is that. And then I know that the sigma of this normal is five, and with this, I can calculate the probability that this point, that the model assigns to this point, here is the R code, which is just to calculate mu according to, to this model, and then you ask to R what is the normal density of the point 30, 32 with this mean and the standard deviation equal to five, right? So again, this is only to stress any statistical model assigns probabilities to data, right? So the situation I showed you in the previous slides can be described like that. I have many hypotheses, two or more hypotheses, which are my statistical models. And all these hypotheses are about the same data set. And each one of these hypotheses assigns different probabilities to data. Can you figure out in this, in the, in this previous slides? Can you see this in the, in the previous slides? Right. So our question is how to choose among all these hypotheses which one is better supported by the data? And the answer is quite simple. Choose the model that says that what you see is the most probable thing to happen. So the model that assigns the larger probability to your data is the more 
plausible model or the best, better, best supported model by the data. So this is what we call the likelihood law in a very, very informal uh, way, in a very, very informal statement. Does it make sense for you? So the least squares is only a variant of this. Uh, let's take a look on how this law behaves with, with a very, very simple example, the most simple example you can find in statistics textbooks, which are urns or boxes with balls of different colors, and you don't know how many balls of each color you have within the urn, inside the urn, but you can pick some balls at random and make some inference, make some guess about the proportion of balls of different colors within the urn. So, uh, in this case, uh, for any reason, we have only two hypothesis. The first one, hypothesis A, says the balls in the urn are all red. You have only red balls in the urn. And the second hypothesis say half of the ball are red and half of the balls inside this urn or box uh, are white. So, and the data, the, the procedure to, to collect data about the system is to pick some balls at random from the box. Suppose we did this once, a single draw, and the ball was red. As you can see, we proceed with left, leftist examples here. Okay, uh, according to the hypothesis one, what is the probability of this observation? Or what is the probability of the observation of a ball that, that in a single draw the ball is red given the hypothesis A, or what is the probability that hypothesis A assigns to this observation? One, right? And what is this probability for hypothesis B? It's half, 0.5, right? So according to the two hypotheses, this, is, this observation is possible. This observation would refute, would reject the hypothesis that all balls are white for example, but according to, to the both hypotheses, this observation is possible, but they assign different uh, probabilities to this. And we can do more. We can uh, take the ratio between these two probabilities that these two hypotheses assign to say, to say that the hypothesis A is two times more plausible than hypothesis B, or that the hypothesis A is two times better supported by this observation than hypothesis B, okay? So this is the likelihood ratio and these probabilities or any quantity proportional to these probabilities assigned by the model to data are likelihoods. Well, we usually or, hope, or hopefully don't have a single observation in our, in our data set. So what this behaves, how this does, the, does this behave uh, when we have more, more observations? Well, as, assuming that the observations are independent, which in this case means that I pick a ball at random, mix the balls within the, the, the box, I pick another ball, and these two observations are independent. The result of one draw does not affect the, the result of the, the, the following draw. Well, assuming that, you can apply uh, the basic definition of probability, that the probability of two independent events is the product of the probability of each event. So, if I have two draws and both balls were red, hypothesis A assigns a probability of one for this observation, for this data that has two observations, and the hypothesis B assigns a probability of 0.25 or a quarter for this observation, for, for this data with two observations. And now, of course, our likelihood ratio increases. We have more support for, for the hypothesis A. Now it's four times more plausible than hypothesis B. 
Does this make sense for you? Sounds reasonable? This is, in a nutshell, the reasoning of the likelihood, the maximum likelihood method. We are looking for maximizing the likelihood of our, the, the parameters that maximize the likelihood of our model. Please, a microphone. It's just a comment. The name in English is much more self-intuitive than the name in Portuguese. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it tells much more. Sure, sure, absolutely. Because you know, in Portuguese we use verosimilhança, which kind of uh, well, I don't know uh, uh, a classic word. It's, uh, it's not a word that we use in Brazil. Verosimil, something is verosimil. Yeah, could be. But. Uh, it shows up in textual analysis, right? You might say the story. In, por in Portuguese, a verosimilhança da história, right? Yeah. So if you're, if you're t telling a tale and you want it to sound like, right, you might use that in the context of uh, textual analysis, right? I may, maybe we heard this word in Portuguese in our Portuguese lessons much more than our math lessons, right? And it yeah. fits, you know, this is an important thing. Uh, I think it's, this is how you should think about this. Because you're not telling a story that you think is true when you look at this. Mm -hmm. You're sort of telling a story that could have generated that, right? Yeah. So that's why Paul is being so careful not to say one model is more probable than the other, right? Probable will be an, an a statement about the, the state of the world, right? While plausible is sort of like, well, I don't know if it's, this is true, but it's plausible, right? If this were true, then we would get this, right? And that's what the, the, sim, the probability symbol there is doing, the heavy lifting on, on expressing this, right? You're looking at the, the probability of having observed that given that something was true. So in this universe where this hypothesis is true, then this observation would be plausible, right? It's com compatible, it's not probable. So I, I, it's yeah. a good word, it, it works. And so think about your Portuguese classes when you think about likelihood, it might, might help. It's verosimil, it's likely under this hypothesis. Okay, if you agree with that, we will we'll define a function which we will call the likelihood function which is any function which is proportional to the product of the probabilities that the model assigned to each observation in your data. So a more compact way to write this down is this. This is the symbol for a product. And let's read, because well, notation is important. So this is the symbol for the likelihood function. And this is the product of the probability assigned to each one of the observations, y, i, from y1 to n, n is the, the sample size, according to a given hypothesis, according to a given statistical model, right? So this is the definition, the general definition of the likelihood function. To ease calculations, uh, we use the log of the likelihood function. This is the called the log likelihood function. And when you take logs of products, these products became sums, and this is a conveni convenience of that. So the definition of the log likelihood function is that any function that it's, is proportional to the sum of the log of the probabilities that a model assigned to it, each observation, okay? Oh, by the way, these slides are not in our site. Now, I don't know what's happening. There's some problem with the site, but, but the website of, the, of this course, I mean. But we will share the slides with you after the class. So some, some very, very important things here. First, the likelihood is a function of the model parameters. If you change the values of the model parameters, you change 
the value of the function. But every likelihood function is conditioned to the data. The function talks about probabilities assigned to a given data set. So you fix the data and you change the parameters to see how this function behaves. So the data is invariant in this function and the model uh, and the parameters are the arguments of this function. And because that, among many things, likelihoods, likelihood functions are not probability distributions. We use probabilities to calculate likelihoods, but they are not probability distributions. This is a very, very important distinction. That's why we use to say that the likelihood function is a function that expresses support, support by the data to a given statistical model. It does not express probabilities Okay, and so for some notation, we will use this notation to express, well, L, Y, theta to express a likelihood function condition, conditional to a given data set Y, which have many observations, Y1 to Yn, and this is a function of a set of parameters that we call theta, and you can have as many parameters you want within this, this set from theta 1 to theta i, okay? In the case of the linear regression, we have three parameters within what we call t. So this is a, a compact notation for any likelihood or log likelihood function. Okay, let's take a look on the likelihood function of our linear regression model. So this is the expression for the normal density probability. In the linear regression, so you can see the, you can see the parameters of the normal distribution here. Parameter mu is here, parameter sigma is here and here. Okay, so this is a function that once you define the values of sigma and mu, you can find the the normal density, the value of the normal density probability for any value y, okay? So in the linear regression, we know that the parameter mu is a linear function of another variable, x, y, x. So we just substitute mu by this expression here, right? So the parameter set of a linear regression is beta 0, beta 1, and sigma, and the likelihood function is just the product of this expression for each one of the values of my data y, i. So it's just, I just added a symbol of product, productory here, a product of this calculated for each y which in this case is represented by the predicted value here. Is it clear? The general idea at least, I know that th this math notation for people from, from biologists, well, you are getting used for, with that, but anyway, the general idea is clear. So it's, it's only, please, Paula. I, I understood, but at the same time, I need some more clarification. Sure. Uh, like, for instance, likelihood functions are not probability distribution functions, but they seem quite similar in the way that probability distribution uh, tells you how likely it is that a certain point, a certain date, are inside the confidence interval, right? In, in a certain way. Uh, what? What to me, I, I, I'm, I'm afraid I, I didn't get. What to me, uh, are not, these are not probability distributions because... It was written in the, in the slide before that. Like, like likelihood functions are not probability distribution sure. functions. Sure. But they're still quite similar in the way that both of them tell I how see. 
uh -huh. how plausible our model is. So I'm trying to understand the difference in practical terms. Sure, sure. Well, uh, this function here depends on data, right? So you have a data set x, y, and you fix this, and you can calculate this function for any value of beta 0, beta 1, and sigma. OK, so this is a function of these three parameters. The normal distribution is not a function of that. The, the normal for the normal distribution, you fix the parameters are fixed, and the normal distribution is a, distribu it's a function of the observations. You give observation for this function, and it, this function returns to you uh, the probability or a probability density value. Here, you don't have this. You are using probability, uh, a probability function here, but this is not a probability function anymore because, well, if you take any constant out here or if you multiply this by 10, it will still a likelihood function but, well, probabilities can range from 0 to 1 only. So if you multiply this by any other quantity, this is still a likelihood probability. But this uh, is not a... Uh, yes, yes. Got it? Uh, the difference in mathematical terms I understood. Okay. What I mean is in practice, in practical terms. If the result of your normal distribution uh -huh. and your result of a likelihood function, what is the difference between the two values? The res you mean the result of this function? Yes, if you calculate it. will be a number, any number, which is a product of a given number of probabilities, right? So you have the probability assigned to observation one, two, three, so on. So you take this, multiply all these, or you take the logarithms of these probabilities at sum, all these values up, and we will have the result of the sum. This is not a probability, right? Still? Uh -huh. You have a result that tells you something about that um, set of y's. And when you calculate the L y, mm -hmm. she's asking, what is that telling us? Is that it? Okay. Like well, for example, let's have, uh -huh. let's say we have a set of data it's and we calculate both yeah. of them for that. Okay, okay, okay. I think well, this will be this will get clear a little bit ahead, but uh, we will get a number that express the support of this model. Uh, the support this model has from the data. How plausible is this model given some data set? So this is a number. What you do with this number, is that the question? What this number means? This number only has a, mean, a meaning if you compare this value to the, to the value of another likelihood distribution for another statistical model. So likelihoods, that, that's why I, I calculate a likelihood, likelihood ratio, right? So it, it means something only when you compare. Likelihoods are only meaningful have when you compare one to another, which means that you are comparing two models. The number in itself does not tell you, tell you much. You have to take this number for two models, two likelihood values for the same data, and then you have some interesting things to do with that. Basically, comparing models and fitting models. It's getting clearer? Right. So we have two questions here. Yeah. Um, Jogo and Paula, if you want to add something, feel free. Um, um, I think I'm not, it's not really clear to me what exactly is the probability density function. It's not the same as because I'm thinking about the example from before. So each observation had a 0.5% chance of being a red ball, right? Mm -hmm. The first uh, equation is that, the, the probability of each observation happening in some specific way, or is it something else? 
Actually, this, this equation, th this expression is the, what we call the probability density function. Because for continuous random variables, we have probability densities. And you can find probabilities if you take, so this probability densities makes, draws a curve. And probabilities are, are, are areas under this curve. Okay. So, but for the calculation of, of likelihoods, it, it doesn't matter because probability densities are proportional to probabilities if you have a good, uh, a good precision in, in your measures. So, as, as likelihoods are any, any function that is proportional. To, to probabilities, you can use probability density. This is kind of technicality, but okay, if, if we can talk more about that later. But still, this is not the probability, but the probability density function of the normal, right? This is an important distinction. If you are looking at probability distribution, it's not that important for the calculation of likelihoods. It will work with that too. Okay, we have more questions. Uh, that was it. That was it, okay. Okay, let's see how this likelihood function of this model behaves. And to do that, well, the linear function has three, three parameters, so we, to, to ease visualization, I will show you here how the, uh, I show you here uh, the likelihood function for a model with two parameters fixed, and I will change only one of the parameters, which is beta zero, okay? Just to, to take a look on this in this kind of plot, because we have a three-dimensional problem if we try to change all the parameters and see how likelihood function will behave if you change all the parameters at the same time. So this is a model with the value of beta zero five, and this is the model with beta, beta zero ten. And you can say that if you fix the other parameters, the likelihood of the second model is larger. So Fixing the other, the, the other values of the other parameters, this model is better supported by the data than this one. Make sense? So if this makes sense for you, all we can do is to find the maximum of the likelihood function to fit a model, right? So we have to, given a model, so say a Gaussian linear model, all we have to do is to find the combination of the three parameters that maximizes this function. This is not a trivial problem because you have a function with three parameters. You can have to try values for the, all three parameters until you find the maximum of a three-dimensional function. Okay, so think like that. Think more or less like a surface and you are walking in the surface and finding the highest point in the surface, the highest, highest mountain in the surface. So doing that is what we call the maximum likelihood method, which is the same of saying that this is the way we, we use likelihood to fit models. It's just to find the combination of parameters of your model that maximizes the value of the likelihood function of your model. So the first, first thing that you have to do is to define this function. Once you define the function, you, can, you have to find the, the maximum of this function, or better, the values of the parameters of this function that maximize it. Okay. So in some case, you can do math to, to, to do that. And in many cases, you can't. So I will show the, the example of the linear regression, the simple linear regression. You can deduce by math the, the values of the MLEs, the maximum likelihood estimators. Well, the, the math is here. I will pass very quickly 
just to show the general idea, the f well, you have uh, the log likelihood function. First, you take the, the logarithm of the likelihood function, which means taking the logarithm of this expression here, which gives you this, which is way more simple to deal with. And then you have to take the derivatives of this function in respect to each parameter. Why? Mathematicians, help us. Why we are taking the derivative of this function to find the maximum of this function? Can you explain that? Um, a physicist, but. A physicist, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of, kind of a mathematician that deals yeah. with the real world, <laughs> more or less. Okay. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> derivative. Sorry, mathematician. <laughs> You also, you are dealing, <laughs> you don't like it. I'm not sure if we can go through this, but how would you define physicists? <laughs> ah, you are too, okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, Sorry, mathematicians, just, never mind, anyway. So, the derivative is the rate of change. Right? Yeah. So as long as the function is changing, we can still walk forward or backwards, and it's going to increase or decrease. Right? Our red dot, uh, if the derivative is different than zero, as long as we vary the value of the beta parameter, beta zero, the x, we are going to change the value of the function. Mm -hmm. However, if the derivative is zero, that means that changing the value of x, or beta zero in this case, is not going to change the value of our function. So that could represent either a maximum, where we are standing on the top of the hill, mm -hmm. or a minimum, if you're standing on the valley of a hill. Yeah. Yeah. So just to be clear, uh, m the derivatives of all the parameters should be zero at the same time? Yeah. Okay. If you have more than one parameter, you have to find, you have to solve a system of, of equations, right? You take the derivatives, equal all the derivatives to zero, and then try to solve this for all the unknown values, which are the, the parameters. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. So, so if, well, Please, please. No, uh, that's because we are recording, so. Really. Okay, um, it's just I wanted to point out that I, I don't know if um, uh, likelihood functions can be uh, non-differentiable thru throughout the whole uh, um, um, domain. Domain. Mm -hmm. So um, if. It's not, if there's a point that you cannot differentiate, you also have to consider that because this sure. point can also be a point of maximum or minimum. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You're, you're totally right. But as far as, uh, as I know, the distribution, density distributions that we use are all continuous and differentiable. I don't know, Diogo, Paulo, do it. Yeah, I think that for most of the models we use, we can assume that, I mean. Okay, that's it, so this is the mathematical trick. If you have a function like that, geometrically, a derivative is the rate of change at a given point of this function, and this rate of change is zero at the maximum or at the minimum of, of any function. Continuous function that can be derived, of course. Okay, so that's why we take the derivatives of the, the likelihood function for each of the parameters and equal this derivative to zero. So these are partial derivatives because you have a function with three parameters. You have to take the derivative in respect to each parameter separately. 
So this means that the, the partial derivative is just you are taking the derivative in respect to this beta zero, taking the other parameters as constants, and so on, so on, so on. So this gives you this system of equations that uh, implies in these other equations here. And guess what? If you if you take, for example, the first two equations of the system and solve them for beta zero and beta one, what do you get? The very same expressions for the estimators of beta one and beta zero from the least square methods. Method, pardon me. Least squares method. Nice, isn't it? So, if you go through all the math, you will show that the least square methods for the linear regression, the Gaussian linear regression, is the like maximum, it's equal to the solution you get for the maximum likelihood method, with the maximum likelihood method. In other words, for this specific model, the least square methods is a maximum likelihood solution. And the parameter, the, the, the parameter estimates here, so are maximum likelihood estimators. This is, these are the expressions for them that we already know. Cool, isn't it? Well, you can do this kind of, uh, please? No, continue, maybe you'll answer right now. Yeah, really? Oh, great, so I'm still guessing what what kind of question are going to make. So you can do this kind of, of, of math to find analytical expressions for other maximum likelihood estimators, but only for very simple models, like if you want to, to fit your data to a Poisson distribution, you need a single parameter to estimate, you need to estimate a single parameter, which is the single parameter of the Poisson distribution, which is lambda, and what is the maximum likelihood of the lambda, which is lambda hat? It's simply the sample mean. So you take the, the sample mean, the mean of the values, the arithmetic, arithmetic mean of the values in your sample. Uh, this is the best guess to fit a Poisson to this data. Of course, if you want to fit a Poisson, your data should be counts, right? So there are some other reasons to decide if you want to fit or not a given model to your data. You have to know about probability distributions and other properties of the model to think if this model is reasonable, to think about on if this model is a reasonable hypothesis for your data, to describe your data, right? And so on the normal, what, what if you want to fit a normal to some data, the best guess is according to the maximum likelihood uh, method is that me can be estimated, is estimated by the, the sample mean two, and sigma is estimated by this quantity which is close to the expression of the standard deviation from the samples with a you know, difference. You probably remember that if you we use to estimate the, the standard deviation in samples with this expression, but uh, n minus one in the denominator, right? There is not missing? No, there is not missing. It, it's, it's, only, it's only showing to you that the maximum likelihood estimator of the parameter sigma in the normal, for the normal distribution is not the same of another estimator that you use for sigma in your samples. So this sigma hat is different from all the, the, the sigma hat we use to estimate, which is this one. I will call it uh, well. There is a summation missing here, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. No realized. So it's uh, 
that's it. So we use this because this correct, corrects for bias in small samples. When the sample is too large, it does not make much difference. But this is the estimator, oh sorry. This is the estimator uh, for the maximum likelihood method and it gets unbiased as, as the sample size increases, okay? And so for the binomial, if you want to estimate the parameter of the binomial, which has the probability of success at each trial is just the observed proportion of successes in your, in your sample. The exponential, uh, it's a distribution that we have not seen, but it's a continuous distribution for times. The most simple one has a parameter which is called also lambda, but it's another parameter. And the MLE of this parameter is the inverse of the, the sample mean. And there's another distribution for times, for discrete times, which is called geometric, that has this maximum likelihood parameter. So, all of these are analytical, uh, what we call analytical solutions for maximum likelihood estimators. Someone smart enough did the math and get these results, okay? What he or she did, take the derivative, define the likelihood function, took the derivative of this, of this function in respect to all parameters, take this derivative equal to zero and solve the system, okay? So in many cases, in many simple cases, you can do that by math. Okay, let's look at an example that uses this analytic, analytic maximum likelihood estimates. Say, for example, that you want to fit a Poisson distribution to a data of counts of trees, of palm trees in plots randomly, well, that you put randomly in some area of forest. So this is true data, 568 plots in the Atlantic forest, in the area of Atlantic forest, and a total of 4,000, more than 4,000 palm trees recorded in these plots. In some plots, you, they found more palm trees, and other plots, they found less, so you can even have, you can even have some plots that have zero palm trees, okay? Can happen. And you do have lots of plots that they haven't found any palm tree there. So to fit a Poisson distribution, all you need is the sample mean. This is the maximum likelihood estimator of the Poisson model which is just a Poisson distribution, and for any, some reason you think, well, let's try a Poisson distribution for this count data. So this is the Poisson distribution with this value for lambda. This is the probability or the, the proportion of plots that should have zero, one, two, and so on palm trees, and this is the observed values. A terrible fit, right? So this is to stress that you can fit any model with the likelihood, the, the, the maximum likelihood method, and this does not mean that this fit will be good. But let's take a closer look at this. Why this fit is not good? Biologists, help me. There's a well-known reason about the distribution of plants in space that explains why this fit is so poor. Rosa. Mateus. Probably the distribution of palm trees is not at random in space and they are clustered, they are Patch. There are patches of, uh, of places that have more counts of palms. Right, right. Can you see any evidence? Yeah, I agree. And can you see any evidence of, of your hypothesis in, in the observed data? Well, there are lots of plots that have 
no palm tree. And uh, there are some plots that have um, 60 trees per plot, and that is not probable by this uh, Boston distribution. Exactly, exactly. That's it. So plants in nature is, well, I think it's all kinds of environment, but especially in tropical environments, plants tend to be clumped. And so you can see this clumping in this, in this frequency distribution with a few plots, with a lot of plants, and a lot of plots with no or few plants. So they are clumped at some spots. And when, it, when you draw your plot, your quadrat there, you will find a lot of plants if, if your quadrat is drawn in another, from another site. So you will see no plants or a few plants. So that's it. There's a distribution that allows clumping. It's, it's a generalization of the Poisson distribution that has a, an additional parameter that you can tune to allow more or less clumping, which is called the negative binomial distribution. So we can fit this to, uh, well, if I'm not wrong, you don't have analytical solutions for that, so you have to use the computer to fit a, a negative binomial distribution for this data. But you can do that, and you will get a likelihood value for both fits. And you then can compare these two fits. Remember that I calculated the likelihood ratio to check which model is best supported for, which model is best supported for the data. So that's it. And in this case, we can see that we can find a negative binomial that provides what looks like a way better fit here. And the difference in the log likelihood, between the log likelihoods is that, 1,000 close to 2,000, which means that the likelihood ratio in the likelihood, because you know, here I am in the log scale, so I have to take the exponential of this huge number to find the likelihood ratio, which is a huge, huge number. So this shows us that the negative binomial fits this data or is way more better supported by the data than the Poisson distribution. So here's the answer for your question. Likelihoods only well, have some meaning, make sense if you compare them. And you can only compare likelihoods conditioned to the same data. There's no point in comparing likelihood values for models fitted to different data, because by definition, this function is conditioned to the data. So it's, OK? So if they are talking about a given data set, so it makes sense if you are trying to compare models that talk about the same data set. That's it. So as I told you, uh, these analytical solutions for, for the maximum likelihood estimators are available only for very, very simple models, like the linear regression models, like fitting some, some um, distribution prob probabilities. But for most of the cases, we don't have an analytical solution, but we can, we have numerical methods. You, you can define, you can still define the function, the likelihood function, and use numerical methods, usually by some computer, computer algorithm, to find the maximum or the minimum of this function. If you take the log likelihood and if you take the negative value of the likelihood, then you have to find the minimum of this function. If you are looking for, if, if you are looking at the log likelihoods, you have to find the maximum. But never mind, it's for, for, for optimization purpose, this is the same. It's, and well, that's it. Uh, and why it's so hard to find analytically the solution of, uh, uh, of maximum likelihood estimates? That's because even very, very simple models have more, usually have more than three parameters. It's easy to have 
statistical models with 5, 10, 20 parameters. So this is a kind of multidimensional surface and you have to find the maximum, the highest or the lowest point in this complicated surface. So this is quite complicated problem to solve by math and hope now we have computers to do that. So this optimization is a huge field in, compu in, well, in, in computation. It's quite tricky. And my, in my opinion, we have to left this for the specialists. I mean, we have to, all, all that we have to do if we are not specialists in, in computer optimization routines is to find out a good routine. My advice. So in R, as in many other computer languages, you have libraries, packages, whatever you, you prefer to call it, which are software developed by people that know a lot about the statistics and a lot about the optimization methods. And for each model, for each statistical model, you have some tricks and some specific way to find out the, the to optimize the, the problem, to solve the optimization problem in finding the maximum likelihood estimators, right? So my advice is to, well, you have many classes of statistical models. You have to know this class. If you, if you think a given class of statistical model can help you to analyze your data, you have to read a little bit about this talk with someone that has already used uh, this, this, this model. So look for advice of more experienced users and try to find out which are the good libraries to fit this model. You have libraries to fit by maximum likelihood a huge number of classes of, of statistical models. So for example, in R, we know that the LM, which is the the function that fits the linear regression from the package stats, which is one of the core packages in our language. It's, it's uh, stable and affordable and so on for all these functions and all this, this package. So it's a matter of talking with some other experienced user and, hey, what's, what are the packages that are more affordable to fit this kind of model? by maximum likelihood, right? Any question? Please. I'm not sure that at that point when I was going to ask the question that it was answered. Could you return to the slides where we were comparing different models, please? This one? No, much back. Um. Oh, I forgot that, but I can do. Ta -da. Um, the one this with one, probably. The next one. Yes. OK. So in that case, in the, in the graph from the right, that wouldn't be a normal distribution, would it? Yeah. yeah, it's a normal distribution, but in this model, the normal distribution has some function to describe that the sigma parameter increases with x. OK. So I think what I want to ask is, is there mm, an upper limit to the, to the likelihood method, you know? Because, for, for instance, if I have the same, la same graph as I have on the, on the, on the left, mm -hmm. and then for the graph on the right, I keep this pattern of, the, of increasing probability as x increases. Sure. But I have um, a wider cone, you know? Like, it's just wider. <coughs> mm. it, it, for example, if I just... Mm. 
um, make it wider, you know, but still make it increase over as X increases. Making sigma increase. Yes, but so you are trying to build a new model. Yes, yes, yes. And yeah. what is I, I, I haven't understood quite well so far. What's the function you would like to plug in for in sigma? I mean, you want to describe sigma f by another function that yes. describes the increasing of mm. sigma in function as a function of x. No, no, yes. It, I it's the same. Always. No. Oh, so <laughs> Can I, uh, maybe if I s ask in Portuguese, I will. Yeah, sure. For example, aqui a gente tem, tipo, essa, essa probabilidade ela vai aumentando à medida que x aumenta também, certo? Yes. Eu estou dizendo se desde o começo, desde x0, essa probabilidade já fosse maior, entendeu? Então, como se fosse é, de lá ela já fosse maior e ela só continuasse aumentando de forma que é, a mesma quantidade de pontos, por exemplo, estaria englobada nessa nuvem de probabilidade do que no outro modelo, entende? Acho que a minha dúvida é, eu posso só, por exemplo, aumentar essa, essa nuvem de probabilidade, esse intervalo de probabilidade e... Não sei, botar em palavras. <laughs> I well, I will let tell me if if is this model you are figuring out what well, we have here. Me and then well, this model says oops, well, could be a curve too. I'm, I'm using which means, well, let's write down this model. Now sigma has an i, right? And so, and sigma is some function of x2, right? So this function here is, well, I, I, it, it was not a good choice, but I, I use it here, a linear function for sigma2. So sigma is also a linear function with beta2. different parameters that allows me to use different rates of increase of sigma in respect to x. Right? So what you tell is that we can change this function to change these limits. Well, this is, a case. This is just the 9% limit for the, the normal distribution I'm using in this model, right? So what you are proposing is to change this function in a way that this limit increase, enlarge this. Okay. Maybe like that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you yes. can, you could do that. But then, um how would I know that this model is not as adequate as the from one from the left, you know? That's because uh, now at that point, many of my observations are now inside the, the, the interval that I defined. Yeah, that's, that's a nice question. Do, does, do someone have... I guess. 
That's a great question well, to think about yeah. alternative models, yes, as models as hypotheses. For yeah, I wanted data. to comment on that. I don't know if I'm going to say something that's not like, correct, but your idea is not to fit all your data. It's to describe with parameters that best fit your data. So it doesn't, w it doesn't help if you fit everything on the curve just because you put wide enough. Yeah, it's like he said, you, you need something that describes well and not just describes the data that you found. You know, make sense? Yeah. Noise. Just a comment. Here, your goal is to know uh, the values of the parameters, maybe mu, the mean of the normal distribution, and sigma that uh, best fits your data. So uh, we have the uh, expected value of mean that make the, the line of the, no, uh, the linear uh, fitting and the interval of sigma. So uh, firstly, the distribution density function is, uh, is helpful to know the probability of observing your data. So you know the, this, the, 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 the function of the density probability to calculate this probability. So if uh, the probability is low, so the data points will not be near to the lines of our, the fitting line in the interval of sigma, okay? So you use uh, the maximum likelihood method to find the best value of mu and uh, sigma that uh, give high probability of your data point to be near uh, to the, the expected uh, uh, mean, for example, or to be inside of this uh, interval of sigma, okay? And that is the difference between the density probability function to calculate uh, the probability of uh, observing the data, and you use the function of the maximum uh, likelihood method to uh, calculate the values of mu and sigma that can best, that can, 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 can find out uh, the best code uh, uh, that will give, uh, will allow your data point, uh, will tell you that your data point is can be observable. <laughs> it's clear? Right. Well, not well. I think it's the it's another way to say the same thing. All you said is that if you try to find a model that increases the probability of these points here, it can came at the cost of assigning too high probabilities to this point, because you know you will do something like that. So the question is, if this is better supported by the data than this, and you can answer this question, calculate the likelihood, fitting both models and compa comparing the likelihoods, the maximum likelihoods of, of these models. So all the guesses here is that it could not be a good idea, but well, you have you have all, all the tools of model comparison to do that. That's what we will see tomorrow. More questions? We have time. Comments? Okay. Just a minute.
okay, and now we see, we saw the, the, the method of maximum likelihood, and it gives you MLEs, the maximum likelihood estimators, and these estimators have some very, very nice properties. So they are faster, stronger, better, etc. So for example, some of the good properties this estimate to have, they are consistent, which means that they as all these properties are properties at the limit of an infinite sample, so this, this this, this estimators behaves, behave like that when you increase your sample. So they are consistent, that, which means that they converge to the true value of the parameter. They are efficient, which means that they are the the most precise estimators among the consistent estimators that you can think for this kind of models. And because of these properties, they are also tend to a normal distribution as your sample increases. What means, what does mean this normal distribution? Imagine that you fit, on, you take data, fit your model, so you have some parameter estimates, and then you take new data and fit again the model, and so on, and so on, and so on. Then we will have a lot of values of maximum likelihood estimates. And if you take a look on the distribution of these parameters, this will approach a normal distribution as the sample size increases. So it's a very, very important uh, pro property of, of this estimators because if we believe that our sample sizes are large enough, we can do a lot of interesting inference assuming that the distribution of these parameters uh, is normal, okay? And in general, you have uh, also that if you apply a monotonic function to a maximum likelihood estimator, this will be also another maximum likelihood estimator. So if you take a log, if you take the square root of, 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 of MLE, you have another MLE. This is handy in many times, sometimes. So we will, we will get back to that because in the next lecture, now that we know how to fit a statistical method with this, this how to fit a statistical model with this method, we will see what we can infer from, from this fit. Well, I gave a cue to you. We can use likelihoods to compare models, but there are way more, much more about that to say tomorrow. And we can also make some interesting inferences about the parameters of the model themselves. For example, is it plausible that the slope of my linear regression is larger than zero? Sounds familiar for you? So you can use uh, significance tests to, to answer this question, but you can use also some quantities that you get from the maximum likelihood fit to do this as well. And you can make some interesting inferences from this fit also to the pre about the predicted values. Okay? So here are my recommended readings for this, this topic. And we have still five minutes to more questions. Please. Thank you. Can you go back one slide? Which one? This one? Yeah. Uh, maybe the second property of efficiency is something that has to do with what we were discussing here before. Like, you can take a bigger sigma, but that, like everyone explained, would make your model worse in some sense, hmm. right? Because increasing sigma would, uh -huh. would uh, mean that you would predict things uh, in a less efficient way. I'm not sure if, would you please, Joe? Because this, this property is also talking about the distribution of the parameters. So the mean square error, it's about the variance 
of the parameters is if you take many samples and fit the model many times. So this is, this is the same to say that the variance of, of, of the, the, mean, the, the estimator is the uh, smaller value possible. So the precision of the estimator, you can, you can think about the precision of the estimator if you think in many of those samples. So you take many, if you took many samples and fit the model many times, to each of those samples, we will have different values of a given parameter, right? If, in doing that, these different values vary a little, you have a very precise estimator, right? So it's talking about that. The, the mean square, in this case, is of the parameter, not the mean square of, of the fitted values. Okay, more comments, questions? Well then, thank you for your attention. See you tomorrow.